Okay, so our next speaker is Jack Skinner, and he's going to be telling us about teaching and learning what I learned from a year of mentoring at UTS. Uh, Jack is a senior web developer who's been coding over half his life, and during the evenings he's found organizing community tech events and conferences in Sydney and teaching and mentoring at the University of Technology, Sydney. He's also a soon-to-be API evangelist at MIOB, working to help developers build awesome products with APIs. He's also known to blog occasionally. So, without uh, any further ado, Jack, take it away. Thank you kindly. Um, so, my name is Jack Skinner. I'm currently an API evangelist, but I've been doing years and years of dev work uh, and, and also teaching and mentoring at, at UTS. Um, I'm also told that it's trendy to put your Twitter handle up on the slides so that you can tweak, uh, tweet either nice things or heckles. Both are welcome. Um, heckles are more entertaining, so I strongly recommend them. Um, so I'm developer Jack, uh, Instagram, Twitter. Um, if you like to take photos of me in embarrassing poses during talks, uh, that's awesome. The less embarrassing, again, the more boring it is. So I challenge you for an embarrassing photo. Um, I want to set the stage for my talk a little bit because um, we're going away from code to begin with uh, into the classroom. And specifically, um, talking about a new studio program that we've started at UTS uh, to teach programming uh, and software engineering better in a studio and project environment very different to a classroom environment. So traditionally you think uh, lectures and tutorials and you know, 20, 30 plus students sitting around a room writing exactly the same code. Uh, instead, the studio is an opportunity for students to work on real projects. We have industry representatives coming in and giving them challenges, but also mentoring them. Separate and independent from academic influence. Um, so, Small audience, quick show of hands, who has or, or is going to work in a team environment? Everyone! Who thinks teams can sometimes look like this? Especially uni teams. Um, half of us um, will actually do some work. And there's always that one person who's not going to do any work and gets a free ride out of it, right? And there's trials and there's stress and we do some work and we don't do some work and we kind of loop back to where we were and we come to a grinding halt at the end of the ride. We've all passed, um, but it's been a different experience for some of us uh, than others. Um, one of the great things about the studio is it is purely opt-in as an extension for academic uh, study. You, you borrow from a subject and instead of doing the calculator assignment, you'll do project work instead. So students actually have to put in more time and effort to get exactly the same amount of marks and, and credit towards their course. Um, so this is what the studio looks like. Um, I managed to catch this uh, terribly embarrassing photo of Carlin. I'm not sure if you can see that with the lighting. Um, but the, the studio is, is pods with stand-up tables and whiteboards all around the room, specifically designed to take students away from worrying about the lines of code, worrying about what they're writing, and helping them focus more on why they're writing and what they're working towards. Um, specifically, I, I wanted to highlight this photo here as, as an exercise we did in engineering. Has anyone done the teamwork, build a tower with straws kind of exercise or pasta or whatever it is, variations on a theme. Um, my favorite bit about this particular exercise when it's done with brand new students. These are students that are coming out of high school and have never written a line of code in their life. Um, Instead of teaching them lines of code, we teach them how to think about problems. We were given the challenge to build the tallest tower to support five marshmallows. I stand for 30 seconds. Really simple requirements. The fresh students in the studio asked questions like, can we join the straws? Can we use less masking tape? You know, push the boundaries and the parameters, but that was about it. Um, the junior students, and I will touch on this a little bit later on, the junior students would also experiment more with their design, whereas the more experienced students uh, in the latter years of their course would plan their design and then execute it. It's very interesting to see the comparison between how different groups of students think. No students, funnily enough, asked to see the marshmallows. No one 30 to 40 students, no one actually asked to see why they were building this tower and what they were building it for. Does that sound familiar? It turns out we, we built these amazing towers and, and we, we were planning to suspend a store at the top so it wouldn't topple over 
and center of gravity and, and suspend the marshmallows, but then the straws were too big because we used the little coffee-sized marshmallows. So the, the big emphasis here is to question why and what you're building rather than how and just go for it before you even have to touch a line of code. Um, now, I like to think of software engineering as much like an onion. There's many layers, and if you bite off more than you can chew, it's a bit of a painful experience. Same goes for students. And especially when they're learning, they get through one layer, and there's something else to learn. And they get through another layer, and there's something else to learn, and so on and so forth until perhaps you give up. Now, I also really like the onion uh, analogy because it's much like problem solving and, and the uh, tower building example. If we're told to get to the core of the problem, there's so many layers to actually get there with what we're told as programmers, as software engineers, as technologists, that often we get near enough and give up. Now, there's a lot of research that's been done, and I'm not going to get too nitty-gritty with the academics, but essentially, the younger you are, the more likely you are to take risks. We kind of all know that, and laws, and intrinsically we, we kind of know that as you grow up you get more experience and wisdom and so on and so forth. Um, if I gave you each uh, an onion and said, um, what's in the middle, I bet none of you would take a big bite and see what happens. Give it to a three-year-old and they might. Now, the reason we don't is because we've had an experience and we've, we've learned from that experience. We know not to do something. Um, and so even though we're told what's in the middle, we take a very different approach on our experience than someone who hasn't had that. So for me, it's all about challenging the way you approach a problem and really getting to the source of that problem before you get to code. And that's something that students, I find, are doing more of now in the studio than when they're presented academic material. Now, as a, a mentor, but also as a, a lab tutor, the biggest thing that I've learned, it's absolutely okay to be wrong. You cannot know everything. Um, it, it's a, a brilliantly exciting world of technology, and I can only fit so much in, in my noggin, right? So question things. Know what you don't know, and use that as an opportunity to pick your curiosity and let that drive your learning. Now, Traditional classroom experiences, three to 500 students in a lecture theatre are going to have a very, very different experience to those that are given a problem and the resources and the support to teach themselves because they can use that to drive their curiosity and their learning. Now, I really, really love this picture. Uh, it's an old MIT lecture theatre. Um, and it represents to me that what I'm teaching at the front of a classroom can be so very distant to an audience at the back. I can see, for example, that there's a gentleman in the back row on his phone. And how many students in my classes would be on their phones and Facebook, distracted from the message that I'm trying to communicate? It's also, uh, I think, a, a big problem that we have cookie-cutter results for software engineering. There is no such thing as a cookie-cutter problem. Every problem is new and it's interesting. And, and whilst we have patterns and, and frameworks and libraries and toolkits, understanding that problem and how to solve it in code is more valuable to me. So I like to experiment more. And that's really what the studio is all about. For the last 12, 18 months of, of running this program for, for three to six months um, semesters, it's all about putting up the walls not letting anyone else come in and influence that, and really trying to experiment and figure out how best to build software. Now, it's also really important, I think, that it is an isolated environment. There's no external influences. The studio itself is a bit of an academic experiment to see if this works. And so while we're in that pilot experimentation phase, we don't have curriculums and other influences controlling what we teach, how we teach, how it's delivered, what must be in the exam. There is no exam in the studio. And in fact, most of the marks now are all about self-reflection. When it first started, it was a, an equal distribution of uh, about a third and what you actually built. About a third in how your group communicated and voted against or for each other, and about a third in reflections. 
now it's at least 50-60% on what I learned and what my journal says. And this is a really, really big thing that I've taken away from the studio. I do this uh, after every talk, after each project, after each meeting. I take just a couple of minutes, maybe grab a coffee, book out some time in the calendar, and I just look at what I did. How did that go? Look at myself in the mirror and go, well, aside from the embarrassing coffee stain on my shirt, it went well. Or, or perhaps I, I walked around too much, or fidgeted, or, or heckled Ben. And, and that can be pretty dreadful, so I should stop punishing him. But, but the core of it is that I'm able to actually take a step away from the experience and go, what have I learned as an engineer? What have I learned not just about why the bug was there, how I solved it, but what did that deliver? Why was I doing that in the first place? And how can I grow as a technologist as a result? And, and that's, that's true for everything, including talks. I'm, I'm sure everyone here knows about Joined In. This is um, my Joined In page. And if you haven't, um, please comment, heckle, give me some feedback, because it helps me, when I go and reflect and improve on this talk, to make sure that my reflection isn't warped. It gets a, a balanced view. So asking others to review your work, not as complicated as a code review, simply of how do you feel that went? and letting someone talk. You can both grow as technologists out of that experience. I saw this tweeted a couple of days ago. And for those up the back, uh, wait, you're going to perform surgery without anesthesia? Well, this is agile surgery. We need to ask you about your symptoms and complaints after we open you up. And we also need to know what you want us to work on in the first iteration. Uh, this is understandably scary as a patient, but also as surgeons. And I think this ties very, very well into the experience that students have when they learn agile methodologies and, and programming, because there is no framework. I haven't yet learned X pattern. And at the moment, I'm struggling to understand code when you're presenting me a problem to solve. And the two are often confused. So one of the really interesting ways that I've seen the studio go about this, and that has changed a few times as we learn from each iteration, um, is that we give each student their own goal. So the, the studio is, is across um, all years of your degrees, from, from very first year programmers right through to people in their, their final subjects. And they do so by borrowing from subjects. So we give each student, as part of that sort of borrowing of work, something to enjoy, a, a jar of dirt that they can be particularly proud of, something they can hold up and go, I built this. It might not be much, but I did it. And I can be proud of this, and I can share this with someone else. It has my name to it. And that's a really, really important thing for all of us who are contributing to teams and open source projects. Um, we're now at the point where this starts to influence the way the team goes about building a solution. No longer do teams go, right, I need to go there, and I'm going to go straight there. Teams are going, well, I really want to learn more about test-driven development. I really want to learn about this technology. And so teams are a bit more experimental in the way they're solving these problems to get exactly the same solution. And the problem with that is that we, we have a bit of mangled technology. Nothing's really built consistently or designed and what some of us would consider as a, a good architecture or a scalable architecture or, you know, has it been tested completely or is it completely ad hoc and messy? Um, none of these things have really been considered and so we have uh, trouble teaching code, teaching problems with struggling to piece together a solution. But it is really good because students are now exploring more in libraries, architecture, and open source as a wider community. A lot more students are coming and going, oh, I found this new library that can do X. Someone in Sweden wrote it. And they would not have discovered that if they hadn't gone looking and curious and searching. And, and, and that drives more questions within the studio. And, and nice that it's academic, but can we use that code at uni. 
We've spent so much time drilling into someone's head, you can't use someone else's work. Well, you kind of can and you kind of can't, and it gets a bit messy. And, and actually having students ask these questions and go, well, can we use a library? Can we use jQuery or something in our code? Or do we have to write everything ourselves for this assignment? Um, it's even gotten so far as students now going, well, how about we contribute upstream? That would be kind of cool. And so there's this um, grassroots move to, to maybe work on other things other than commercial projects, other than sort of um, scenario-based things. Maybe contribute a feature to a framework. That would be fantastic. But it's daunting. It's, it's really quite scary uh, for a student to go, I don't know this language, I don't know this framework, and I don't know software engineering. How could I contribute to something this big, this fantastic? And so part of the thing that, that I'm starting to drive in the studio is that small contributions make a bigger project. And I, I, I love this. I added this slide this morning, um, had a brainwave and thought, it's so perfect because every little small contribution in open source makes that project a success. And so I, I took an example to my uni team uh, two weeks ago. I was trying to get a code sample up and running in Joomla Framework, the new HTTP library component, and I couldn't get it working. And then I realized that the readme file had a couple of incorrect details uh, in how to get started. So I submitted a pull request and said, I think this, this might not be up to date. Um, it is 2 o'clock in the morning before I do this live demo of Joomla Framework. Um, am I right? A couple of minutes later, pull request accepted, tweeted about it, and suddenly, with a tiny contribution, I've now helped out the Joomla framework. And I took this back to the team and showed them that even small contributions like documentation, like how-tos, if you're a new person to a project and you're having trouble, surely someone else is having trouble too. And I saw these wide eyes in the studio going, that makes sense. So I'm hoping that by the time they've delivered this project in, in a week's time, um, we'll see some more small contributions, a more fleshed out readme file. Just small things like that. Um, now the other thing is part of the studio and, and kind of tying back into each student having their own goals is everyone reinvents the wheel. I, I love reinventing the wheel, which probably horrifies many of the engineers in the room because surely you should use an existing solution to save yourself time and it's tested and it's reliable. But I don't understand it. And by building exactly that same solution from scratch, I understand it better. Of course, maybe I should shelve that and go and use it afterwards. Um, and, and I love the saying, everyone should build their own CMS once and then never use it again because you start to understand some of the challenges that these larger projects have. Um, and, and when you do go and reinvent the wheel, and you leave it somewhere, where do you leave it? No one I know has an answer for this. And, and academically, when we finish off three to six months worth of work, what do we do with it? So one of the things that we're starting to do is, at the very end of a project, Write a post-mortem. As much as we write a, a hello and a, an objective and a mission statement for what problem we're trying to solve, write a goodbye statement. Write an obituary. Say, this project was meant to do this. This is some of the things that we did. And this is where we're stopping. And the objective of that is to no longer let that code disappear into unread history but instead to let another team in the future perhaps pick it up. I'm, I'm very proudly helping look after a project that was abandoned on Google Code, and I tweeted the owner, I said, are you doing anything with this project two years later? And they said, no, please, fork it, take it, look after it. Fantastic. So now I've forked it and need to do some updates, and I should probably find some time to do that. Um, but it lets someone else help out, which I think is the core of what open source is, is all about. 
And when I come back to why I'm mentoring and all these different ideas and thoughts and learnings that I've had, um, this particular image that was tweeted earlier in October really sums it up for me. This is, this is why I do it. This is why. Because it's promoting what I love rather than bashing what I hate. I don't like classroom learning. I don't. It's, it's loathsome, it's tiresome, it's tedious. And yet, instead of having a go at that environment, it gives me a chance to really support something else and see if that can make a change. I, I think this also speaks true for most technology. I will openly admit I have engaged in language bashing at, at least one point in history. And I'm sure all of us have. Just, just once. Maybe, maybe twice now that I think about it. But I'm sure no more. Sure no more. Um, but, but this is why. Because I get a kick out of it. And I can see other people get a kick out of it. And that's exactly why I do teaching and mentoring. Because I love it. Any questions? Thank you. Do we have some questions? We do. Or heckles. Heckles are also welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Um, so I'm with a group of colleagues at Monash Uni who do a similar sort of industry experience thing that's been going for about the same time frame as yours. What I was talking to them about, perhaps looking at in the future, was in addition to getting people from industry to talk to these students to also do like a Google Summer of Code style thing. I was wondering if you think there's any value in that getting students expressly to contribute to open source as part of that project rather than as a byproduct of? Yeah. Um, I, I love the idea. Um, as someone that has done full-time coursework and full-time work for a number of years, I think the time investment for students is um, a very big challenge on those sorts of projects. And one of the problems we have in the studio is if you look at a uh, six credit point subject, we only take up one to two credit points. So that's meant to be about two to three hours a week. Um, you spend that in the face-to-face -face time once a week, and then when you leave review and retro and everything, you're left with no time to actually learn and write code. So I think that um, academically speaking, courses need to be modelled more around hands-on experience and that sort of curious self-learning before we can drive bigger contributions to things like um, Google Summer of Code or, or whatever else might be available. I love the idea, but I think there's a few steps yet to go before higher education can implement that properly. You can tweet them later if, if you don't want to ask them in front of everyone. Yes? So I'm probably coming to the close of my immediate participation in that studio. And it's, it's been interesting to me to step away from certain projects, um, you know, the system admin for the JIRA server and things, is, and just see how people are starting to take that over in my stead. So where I see it in five years, I'm not sure. Where I see it maybe in the next two years um, is as a much more solid program that is separate from a course. So I think there's some driver in, in not just our university, but globally, in, in looking at these sorts of things to be woven into courses. And uh, some of that is being done already with work experience and things. But I think the real benefit from this is taking it away from that academic framework and going, you know what? Normally, postgrad students or master's students would go and just drive their own curiosity. Here's how you can learn code with your own drivers. So I'd like to see it stay somewhat separate from a curriculum. All right. Well, as Jack says, you'll have, uh, you'll, you have any number of ways to uh, reach him, and of course you can reach him face to face during the conference here. So once more, let's give him a big round of applause and say thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.